The title of the message this morning is Authorized Personnel Only. And, uh, and I have this statement, and we're going to come back to it uh, a little bit later, but it has to do with authority. Did you know that authority is only as good as the one who gives it? If someone gives you and authorizes you, I could give you permission to go anywhere you want in the hospital over there. Unfortunately, that won't get you very many places because the authority is only as good as the one who's giving it to you. And so I'd like you to have that in the back of your mind. Welcome back to the never-ending trial of the Apostle Paul. <clears throat> Pastor Steve came into my office this week. I'm going to tell on him. And he said, uh, he just sat down in the chair and he had this defeated look. He's just like, oh. he goes, I've got nothing. I said, what do you mean you got nothing? He said, I said, for your sermon next week? <laughs> what are you worried about? <laughs> I write all my sermons on Saturday night. No, I didn't say that. <laughs> he goes, you know, it's, it's, we're going through the same material over and over again. And I have to admit that that's kind of what these last several chapters of, of the book of Acts is like. But I think God has something unique to show us out of what's happening in, in this chapter today. And so just to bring you up to speed, Agabus had prophesied back in Acts 20, 21 that Paul was going to Jerusalem and trouble was waiting for him there. And that is exactly what happened. And it was kind of uncharacteristic of Paul when he arrived. He wasn't preaching. He wasn't debating. He wasn't evangelizing. He was actually just, just relaxed and quiet. And I don't know if it had to do with the, the warning that was coming. He wasn't trying to stir anything up. But in spite of that, a Jewish mob had seized Paul in the temple, and then the Roman military had to seize Paul from the mob to protect him from them, and the trial, uh, they couldn't get anywhere in trying to sort it out, and so, so the commander of the fortress there who has Paul in custody punts this up the food chain, and so he's been sent to, from Jerusalem to the capital of Judea in Caesarea to see the proconsul there, and he is going to take this mess off of Lysias' hands. So we have three, three bodies of authority. We have three speakers in the text today. The first is the, so picture in your mind a trial in a courtroom, all right? This is, this is a much more formal process. We have the Sanhedrin, who is the prosecution. They've hired a lawyer named Tertullus. We have Paul, who is the defendant, who will speak in his own behalf. And we have Felix, who is the Roman judge. And so as, as you read the text, as uh, they put those texts up for you, I'm going to just make comment and you'll be able to read faster than I can talk, which is saying something. That's pretty good. All right? So, verse 1. It took about five days for the Jewish religious rulers of the Sanhedrin to answer the summons to present their case before Felix the pro procurator of the province of Judea. So the proceedings had been moved from the powder keg, which was Jerusalem, where there were murder plots and mobs and all sorts of stuff going on. And the, they have hired an attorney. The actual word here is orator. This is now a more official setting, and things had to be done in appropriate form. How, how many of you have seen British TV where they do court cases, and they all have those funny little white wigs on? That, that, that's... that's, that's uh, that's the way they do it. It's the tradition. And so the Roman court was similar. They had specific traditions and ways that the court was to be addressed, and there was appropriate attire. So this was not going to be a mob and a zoo. Uh, this was going to be a very different scenario. In verses 2 to 4, Luke interestingly includes some of these formalities. And, and honestly, it's, it's some butt kissing here. Uh, few would agree with what he said. Felix had not exactly promoted peace among the Jews, uh, uh, nor should we accept at face value? When he says, I'm going to make this short, it's kind of like a thing you say. Uh, it's kind of like when pastors say they're going to be short as well. You know, you just take it with a grain of salt. It's going to be what it's going to be. And so, uh, so we all know what flattery is for. We know why people use it, and that's exactly what's at stake here. The prosecution wants the judge to think that they have a great deal of respect for their power and authority and, you know, just starting things off on a good foot. Luke summarizes the case that is presented by the lawyer. So there are three points to his case. Number one, Paul is a thorn in the side of Rome. 
agitating uprisings among the Jews everywhere he goes throughout the empire. That's his first point. Second, he is the ringleader of a specific sect called the Nazarenes. Now, this is the only place in the Bible where that word is used, but this was actually very common even up to modern times in Arabic and, and um, um, Hebrew language. Christians are referred to still as Nazarenes. Of course, we know the relationship, right? Jesus was from the city of Nazareth. And so the Nazarenes are the people who follow him. The third point of the lawyer, his final point, the most specific one, is that Paul had been caught trying to profane the temple, which was a serious thing among the Hebrews. So the first of these charges was very serious in and of itself, if there had been any substance to it. But unfortunately for the lawyer, he is kind of glossing over the details. He is kind of hoping that, uh, that the court will jump to some conclusions along with him. So it's disingenuous for him to say what he says because it's not actually Paul who started any riots, was it? It wasn't Paul who started them. It was people in reaction to things that Paul was saying. And so they actually were the ones who started riots. And this is, this is an outgrowth of this religious spirit that, that dominates and controls them. They didn't like the message. They didn't like that people were converting from Judaism into Christianity. And they just didn't like Paul. They thought he was a traitor. And so when he'd preach, they'd get ticked off and they'd lose it. So Luke, as a historian, which is exactly what he is, he wants a full record from the birth of Jesus to the birth of the church to the birth of Christianity as a faith. And he wants proof, and he is recording this trial, that there has never been throughout the first 20, 30 years of, of, of Paul and Christians being drug into court systems of various kinds, they were never judged by a Roman court as actually being guilty of anything under Roman law. And so, so Luke likes this information on record. In fact, the Roman criminal and civil courts, one after another, have rejected claims as being without evidence when the Jews have drugged the Christian missionaries before their courts. So I think it begs the question, if that's true, then why did the Christians get in so much trouble in the book of Acts? Why was there all this stuff going on all the time? It was because they threatened those in power. They threaten the status quo. Have you ever seen people react negatively just to change? Not because the change itself was bad, but just, no, we don't do change around here. How many of you are people who don't do change? I mean, you can change. I, I, I think of the old red-green. Do you remember red-green? Uh, their mantra was, how many of you know it? Go ahead, Eric. Oh, you don't, oh okay, this is, you're going to like this one. You're going to adopt this. You're going to want to write this down. I'm a man, I can change, if I have to, I guess. <laughs> and so that's the way some people are with change. But when you add in the idea that we are the representation of God, you can't change any of that. And so we can get quite nasty and snarky about the whole thing. And so... So that's kind of what's going on here. Full disclosure, there actually are subversive elements in the culture at this time uh, who, in Jewish communities, who actually did have political aspirations. They would have liked to throw off the, the, the chains of Rome. And, uh, and you remember when Paul was arrested in the temple, uh, the commander actually thought he was the leader of a group of assassins. And so these guys were like pretty intense and pretty serious. And, but when Tertullus is sharing this story about him being a leader of this sect of Nazarenes, he's actually not connecting all the dots. He is kind of hoping that Felix will take a leap and associate Paul, sort of guilt by association. He's another one of those kind. But he doesn't actually say that he's actually doing anything of that nature. The third is actually the most concrete uh, that, that this lawyer brings, the most concrete charge that he brings. And, and note, there's a really subtle tactical shift in what he says. He says that they are prosecuting Paul because he attempted to defile the, the temple. You notice what he's not saying? He didn't defile the temple, but he's attempting. Now, what he's implying is, if we hadn't intervened, it most surely would have happened. That's called being guilty before you're proven guilty. 
That's trying you for the things you might do. And so it's kind of subtle, but this is an experienced orator, and he's hoping that Felix will make some leaps and join the Sanhedrin, who have some influence and power, will join them, and he wants him to condemn them. It was useless to claim he had actually done it. Paul did not defile the temple. He hadn't drug a Gentile into the, into the J- Jewish court. But they said it's only because we, didn't, because we stopped him. So Tertullus is implying that this is an orderly arrest, that the Jews came and said, hey, Paul, you can't be doing this. We, need to, we, we want to sit down and talk with you about it. Now, I don't know if you remember the last sermon, but that's kind of not quite the way it went down, was it? No, this was actually a bloodthirsty mob, and they were trying to tear his limbs from his body. And so this is a bit of rhetorical, um, flowery speech that paints the Sanhedrin and the Jews as these peace-loving, law-abiding Roman citizens who are in defense of the realm. Of course, the Jews hated Rome, and none of this was true. But what else are you going to say in court? Yeah, we hate you, but we hate him even more. So can you guys just figure something out here? Well, that's the end of the prosecution. The prosecution rests. So now Luke enters into this little part of Paul's defense. Paul opens up with also he understands what is obliged, what he's obliged to say, and he opens up with respect for the court. But he's much more succinct. How many of you know that there's a difference between respect and flattery? (laughs) Yeah, and you can tell the difference when these two guys start out. So in verses 11, 13, it said that he says, I've been gone from Jerusalem for many, many years. I haven't even been here. And in less than two weeks ago, I came for the Feast of Pentecost. He had been uncharacteristically very, very quiet during his time there. He hadn't argued, he said. I didn't debate. I didn't discuss. I didn't preach. I didn't proselytize. I didn't do anything. I was just there completing my rites, uh, completing a purification rite according to the law that these guys say they uphold. The truth allows him to be very clear and very specific in his defense as opposed to the innuendo and the implications of those who are trying him. By the way, truth is always on your side. Truth is always a benefit. It's always a gift to you, even if you're wrong. Telling the truth is the best path. Didn't your parents teach you that? How many of you remember? Truth is always the best policy. Do you know what? It's true, even if it gets you in trouble. Because ultimately, you're going to face the truth anyway. The sooner, the better. Get it over with. Deal with it. Take your licks. Take your punishment. Take your spanking. I mean, not that I ever got a spanking, but... I did. (laughs) I even deserved most of them. In fact, I'm pretty sure I didn't get all the ones I deserved. Verses 14 to 16, Paul removes any opportunity for, uh, for uh, for misunderstanding by declaring, let me tell you exactly everything I did when I got to Jerusalem. And so he goes into his scheduling activities. He says, I came to worship God. I'm free to do that, by the way, under Roman law. I'm a Roman citizen. I get to worship. And it is the true way, the way that in fact is most faithful to the very religion that the Sanhedrin, that the Jews actually preach. Far from attacking it, Paul says, uh, he echoes the statements, statements of Jesus. Jesus said, I didn't come to abolish the law, but to fulfill it. And so Paul is basically making the case. I'm not at odds with these guys. I've just understood that where the law was taking us, and that's the same God. We worship the same God. We worship the same God who promises a resurrection and judgment of the righteous and the wicked. He's saying, my conscience is absolutely clear. I will tell you everything that I believe. You, all you have to do is ask. I'm not here to create any trouble. And so the Sanhedrin would, of course, disagree, disagree, and this was their right. But this is Paul's whole point in saying this. They may not agree with what I'm saying. They may not like what I say. I may not agree with them. But this puts this whole confrontation clearly in the realm of religious conscience. And what it does is it removes it clearly from the realm of Roman civil law. There is nothing going on here where the Roman laws have been broken. And so why are we even here? We're here because we don't see eye to eye on religious theological distinctions. 
verses 17 to 19. If Paul is trying to stir trouble, he says, why did I bring, explain to me my accusers, why would I bring an offering to relieve the suffering of the poor and needy among my people? In fact, he says, at the moment the mob grabbed me, I was actually distributing gifts and offerings to people to help them. I was helping the needy. Tell me now, why did you arrest me in the temple while I was sharing the offering for the needy? Incidentally, he says, those who started the riot was not even actually the Jerusalem synagogue or temple. It was Jews who had come from Asia. Do you remember Ephesus? Remember, that was, a, that was a gong show in Ephesus. They really hated him. But they had followed him to Jerusalem, and they were there at the Feast of Pentecost too. And he says, by the way, where are my accusers from Ephesus? They're the ones who started this whole thing. So if they have evidence, why aren't they here declaring what the charges are against me? This is not only a powerful legal point for Paul's defense, but this is actually a serious breach of Roman legal etiquette. You can get in a lot of trouble for bringing a case before the Roman court and tying up the court. And so this was really frowned upon. So while Paul is kind of defending himself, he's also pointing out there are much worse things going on than the things that I've been accused of. Well, in verse 20 to 21, Paul says, so if the Sanhedrin, who, is the one, who are the ones who are here, actually has a charge that they'd like to lay at my feet, have at her. Here we are in court. What are your charges against me? I have done no wrong. And so when it becomes clear that the Sanhedrin really had nothing to say other than that they didn't agree with Paul's teaching on the resurrection, it becomes really clear that there is no legal case here at all. And so he's done a really exceptional job of using the very Roman system that he's incarcerated by to kind of tear this lawyer to shreds. <laughs> he, he really, he really buries him. And so now we come to the third part of the chapter. And this is where we get the not a ruling ruling. The not a ruling ruling. And so verse 22, we finally hear from Felix, who is the judge. He and Felix is pretty well informed about the religious differences and has an accurate knowledge of the way, according to Luke. It may have been through his wife, Drusilla. We'll talk about her in a minute. But she was a member of a famous Jewish family. How many of you have heard the name Herod? <laughs> Herod was a really famous Jewish family. Well, uh, she is a member of this family. At any rate, Felix, Felix adjourns the proceedings pending the arrival of Commander Lysias. Uh, from Jerusalem, because the Jews have painted a very orderly account of Paul's arrest. Paul says, no, it was a gong show. The military had to, had to save me from a mob. And so he needs the commander who's there. Now, the commander has already written in the letter exactly what he's going to tell them. But we're going to realize that Felix is doing more than just waiting for a witness to settle an argument. So, in verse 22, it says, Paul was to remain in custody, but he would enjoy good accommodations, as would be befitting a Roman citizen who has yet been proven guilty of a charge. And of importance was this instruction that Paul have access to his friends. Now, this is going to carry on for two years. He's going to be there in custody under house arrest for two years. And the text doesn't say how important this access to his friends was, but that meant representatives from churches that he had planted. People were coming and going. Paul knew what was going on in the churches, and he would actually write many letters to different churches that you now read in your New Testament during this time where he's bound. He's not out ministering, he's stuck. And so he's just communicating and writing letters, which is a huge benefit to all of us today. I'm so thankful for it. Well, Paul wrote to many of the churches. I don't know how long the Sanhedrin representatives stay in Caesarea. It's not clear. Uh, but they are too influential to dismiss. The, the provincial uh, leader here cannot just dismiss their claims. And in spite of how transparent the case is in terms of Paul's innocence, his incarceration has become something other than a legal issue. It's now a political issue. How many times have we seen that? How many times have we seen a case become a political football that gets batted back and forth? There are, there are very many famous cases that have actually gone all the way to Supreme Court and been turned into specific laws in Canadian criminal justice system because the case became a very hot issue that was about something very specific. And so, so Felix doesn't want to ruffle the Jewish feathers. And so there's something going on here. Um, 
He doesn't want to release the number one most wanted, hated man on the Jews' hit list. Uh, That's going to create all kinds of trouble. Now, Felix's position had been given to him because his brother Paulus was best friends, childhood friends, with the man who would become the Caesar of Rome, Claudius. And so his position was because of that relationship. But there had been a regime change. Claudius was no longer the emperor. And so any protection Felix once had, he didn't have now coming from Rome. And so he was going to have to make sure he really managed and made sure that that he could demonstrate, he could control and create peace in the Judean province, which, by the way, was a really big task. And so no help would be forthcoming here. And he, it says that he kept Paul in prison, not because he was guilty, not because he was waiting for Lucius, Lucius's testimony. We actually don't know, other than he wanted to do the Jews a favor. How would you like to be a prisoner, and you know you're innocent, and the judge knows you're innocent, and your accusers know you're innocent, and the policeman who arrested you wrote a letter that said you were innocent, and yet, because of a political favor, you are in jail for two years, cooling your heels. Who here would be a little ticked off? Who would be stomping and screaming? Who would be hiring a civil rights lawyer? I mean, seriously, and suing the government for millions of dollars for wrongful arrest. Oh, man. Felix... But all of that, Paul has no control over. Paul has no control over what's happening with his case. Verse 24, Felix seems to be willing to increase his understanding of Christianity. So whether it's out of curiosity or some other motive, he and his wife come to visit Paul a few days after, after this whole thing has, has, been, uh, has been put off, waiting for the commander from Jerusalem to come. Other historical versions of writings about this period of time, uh, it's called the Western text, say that Drusilla, uh, who is the one who was especially anxious, the, the wife of Felix was especially anxious. She was a Jewess, and she was from a very famous family, as we talked about. As a small girl, she had been promised to a prince in East Asia Minor, but he refused to, to, become, uh, to embrace Judaism. And so that marriage was canceled. So her uncle, Uncle Agrippa uh, II, actually gave her to uh, an insignificant prince in some other Syrian kingdom. And so she was married as a, little, as a young girl. Imagine your 13 or 14-year-old girl being sent off to be the wife of some prince in Syria somewhere. Well, somewhere along the road, apparently this young lady was very beautiful and she caught the attention of Felix. And so Felix, with a little bit of help, convinced her to leave her husband and come and be his wife. So this is his third wife. She is is his third wife. He is her second husband. And she's still a teenager when this story is unfolding. But she's Jewish. And she wants to understand exactly what it is that Paul is teaching. And so Felix comes along. Uh, Paul's message to these rulers is really clear as we arrive in verse 25. The Christian faith has moral and ethical implications. So here is Paul, the prisoner, lecturing Felix and Drusilla on their responsibility before God. Paul is not shy. Paul is not shy. You know, we rightfully hear and talk much about the grace and the forgiveness and the goodness of God. But the truth is that faith also produces righteousness and holiness. And when our faith that we claim does not produce it, sometimes we need to be confronted. And the Apostle Paul was willing here to speak to the ruler of the Judean province in a way that nobody speaks to the ruler of a Judean province. And he challenges them on their personal integrity and character. Now, the response from Felix and Drusilla is that it says he actually, when he hears the word of God, he actually becomes so nervous, he gets scared. (laughs) How many of you think that that's the activity of the Holy Spirit? That's the Holy Spirit. That's, folks, that is conviction of sin. That is what this is. And so 
In John chapter 16, Jesus said, It's to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the Helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. And he, when he comes, will convict the world concerning sin, righteousness, and judgment. And that's exactly what Paul is doing. And the Holy Spirit is working with him to challenge these high-level provincial leaders about their own standing before God and what they are supposed to be doing with the position that God has put them in. And that is to give righteous and just uh, judgment. Conviction is probably one of the most unpleasant things a person can feel. How many of you have experienced the conviction of the Holy Spirit? How many of you have wiggled and squirmed and argued and... Ugh. And yet I would just like to say that I believe it is one of the most gracious gifts that God's ever given that you can realize when you're stepping out of sync with God that he'll tell you, you're getting out there. You need to come back. And that feeling of responsibility or guilt or whatever it is, I don't know exactly how you would, sometimes it's just, I know what I have to do. I don't want to do it. Who's been in those shoes? Who's, come on, who's been in those shoes? What you said was inappropriate. I want you to go and apologize. That deal that you made, you took advantage. I want you to actually go make that right. You know, when we go through Freedom Session, one of the things we do is we acknowledge our wrongs and we make restitution. We go and we apologize and we see if there's anything we can do to make it right. That's part of the journey. That's part of the journey of walking with Jesus. And so here are Felix and Drusilla face to face with the great Apostle Paul. The Holy Spirit is heavy on them. And, and he gets so nervous that he flees the premises. He doesn't want anything to do, it, do with it. Now, it turns out in verse 26 that we understand that Felix had some other motives. He had some other things going on. He saw an opportunity here. I don't know if it was because Paul was kind of the de facto leader of this new Christian movement. Maybe it was because he understood how generous of an offering he had brought, but he saw a chance for financial gain here. And the text tells us that he was playing the game by the rules that he'd been given. This was how business was done in Rome. He was hoping Paul would bribe his way to freedom, that he'd just give him a little something. So let me read for you something from a, a commentary. F.F. F. Bruce says it this way, so listen to this, describing Roman justice. In spite of firm and reiterated edicts prohibiting bribery, the wheels of Roman law in those days ran more smoothly and rapidly if they were judiciously greased. <laughs> What does that mean? Yeah, we're going to bribe you to do the right thing. <laughs> we're going to bribe you to do what you're going to do anyway. But I'll expedite that for you. Now, if we think about some of the things we've read going through Acts, we'll realize this is true. Remember that the commander, when he arrested Paul, said, you're a citizen? How did you get that? I paid what? I paid a large sum of money to get my citizenship. What's he talking about? He's talking about this is the way the Roman system worked. Got to grease the wheels judiciously to get what you want. And Felix was now holding an innocent man and repeatedly returns to uh, talk to him, hoping that at some point Paul will come up with some money. Where Felix got the idea that Paul had money or that he would actually give it to him, I'm not sure. But is there anything immoral about it when everybody understands that this is exactly how the system works? What do you think? If that's the only way to further the work of God in a country where you don't get a building permit, um, we learned this from Brother Abraham in India, you don't get a building permit unless you bribe an official. You have to pay under the counter to get it to go through. So... Should they use the offering of CFA to bribe an official to get a building permit to build an orphanage to do Christian ministry? What do you think? It's an interesting question, isn't it? If that's just the way things work? Well, apparently for two years, Paul said, that's not the way it works in my kingdom. And he said, no. I'm not saying that it's, I'm, I'm not making a comment on what you have to do in India or another. I've never been there. I don't understand. So I don't have a right to speak to it. But for Paul, he says, no, this is not going to happen. And so in verse 27, we learn that this dance goes on for two years. 
for two years. Felix loses his posting during this time, eventually, at the end of two years, and Festus steps into the governorship. How, uh, now we see why the Holy Spirit led Paul to challenge Felix and Drusilla on moral and ethical grounds. For two years, an innocent man is held waiting for a bribe. <laughs> Doesn't seem fair. Felix is playing politics with Paul's life and with his freedom. And he refuses to release Paul as a political favor to the Jews. Can I ask you, what if God asked you to sit in injustice for two years? Could you do it? And let's say you had no choice. What would be your attitude as you sat in injustice for two years? In Acts 5.19, Peter and John, after being arrested in the temple for preaching Jesus and healing people, are supernaturally transported out of jail. How many of you remember that? That one was pretty cool, right? And then in Acts 12, Peter is arrested during the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Herod's intending to kill him after the feast is over until the angel waltzes him out and takes him down the road to Mary's house. He doesn't even realize it's not a dream until he's out there in the cold air and he actually goes, okay, I'm awake. I'm really out here. And so he's freed from prison again. Can God do whatever he wants to do? Could Paul have supernaturally been released from that place by the power of God? Absolutely. So if I'm Paul sitting around for two years, I'm going, so like what's with the favoritism, Lord? Like what's, what's up with Peter and John? They got out of jail free. How come I'm here? Two years, Lord. It's been two. Lord, I don't know if you're, I don't know. I know you're busy. You've got a lot of things going on, but I've been keeping track. Two years. It's been two years. Just saying. Paul escapes multiple mobs and riots in his evangelistic adventures, and yet here he sits. The whole of the Western realm of Rome is waiting for the gospel, is ripe for the pickings. He wants to go and do that. I wonder how much, I wonder how challenging it was to Paul to consider, maybe I should just pay the bribe and get out there and get planting churches. Two years, he could have planted two churches. Easy. There could be people getting saved out there. And here I am sitting in this house arrest. How many of you would be tempted to get out there and get after the Lord's work? Just pay the bribe. Just get out of here. Get, go do it. These are things that Paul was going to have to deal with. These were things that he was going to have to deal with in his heart as he sat there one day. And, and, and I can imagine that Jesus and Paul had some lively discussions about this. Do you have lively discussions with Jesus about your life? Yes? Who here has yelled at God? Come on. Nobody was around. You're in your vehicle and you're going, what are you doing to me? Where are you? Or whatever. I don't think, I don't think Paul had any trouble and Jesus had any trouble with having lively discussions with Paul. In fact, one day when Paul was begging for Jesus to remove what he called a thorn in his flesh, God tells him flat out, no, you're fine. <laughs> no, just no. I don't imagine Paul liked that answer any more than he liked this one. And I kind of, I don't know about you, but I get the impression Paul was not patient. Just, I'm just going out on the limb here and thinking Paul was a doer. He was assertive and aggressive. Remember how he reacted to John Mark. It was all or nothing, baby. Man, if you're not all in, you're out. And he got rid of that guy. <laughs> and he got in an argument with Barnabas, the son of encouragement, the nicest man on the planet. Paul can't get along with the nicest guy on the planet. So they split and he gets Silas. And I'm going, I got somebody else, man. I'm out of here. I'm going. I don't think Paul was a patient guy. Two years sitting in that house, writing New Testament. I think Paul was an idealist too. How irritating would it be to know that everybody knows you're innocent? Everybody involved knows you're innocent. And yet here I am. How do you deal with frustration? How do you deal with frustration in your life? When things aren't the way you want them. Go ahead, tell me. The, the more you respond and the quicker, the sooner you'll be out of here. That's my encouragement to you. 
So if this gets long, it's on you. How do you react? How do you respond? What's your go-to in frustration? Shout it out. You can tell on somebody else too. What's that? Journaling. Journaling. Well, that's very noble. Okay, I don't want your answer. That's, that's, too, that's too good. That was very good. That's exactly what you should do. How many of you should journal more? <laughs> yeah, okay. Go, go ahead, Eric. Grumpy with those who are closest to you. Who's guilty? Come on. Come on. I don't think there should be any hands down. Come on. I know a pastor from a church just down Resources Road. Oh, he's a handful. By the way, hi, Al. <laughs> Can you welcome Alan Jones from Church of Christ here this, this morning and his wife? I just saw you just now. I, I feel guilty. Now I'm, now I'm going, oh, my goodness, he's such a good preacher. This is garbage. This is garbage. <laughs> Okay, where were we? Oh, yeah, you're frustrated. You're frustrated. What do you do? You get grumpy at people around you. Wine? Oh, yeah. As in wine or... Oh, nah, nah, nah. Okay, gotcha. There might be a little wine, too. I don't know. It's just, it depends on how you... Okay, go ahead. What? Oh, who gets all quiet and, and, and martyr syndrome? <laughs> Suffering in silence for Jesus. Yeah. Anything else? Angry. Angry. Who came to church with somebody who gets angry when they're frustrated? Yeah. <laughs> Let me help you with this. Uh, what do you post on social media? What's the tone and tenor of what you post? Are we all on the same page here? Are, are we, like, what kind of people we get when we're frustrated? I think Paul would have been incredibly frustrated. And yet the scripture doesn't show us anything other than that he just waged that internal war and he stayed put. And he did the best he could in the situation he was in. But God hadn't really been clear other than he had one word over his life. And that was that God was taking him to Rome and he would testify, he would witness to those who were the highest people in power. And so he knew whatever happened eventually, it wasn't going to end here. He knew he had a calling in his life. And God had spoken to him. Can I ask you, do you have that? Do you have that sense that you are a servant of the Most High God? and that you have a calling on your life, and that whatever situation you find yourself in, whether you like it or not, <laughs> is a situation you're going to have to endure and tolerate and learn to find the presence of God in. And for me, if you're like me, it kind of comes and goes. It's really easy for me to tell when I'm allowing the Spirit to lead and dominate versus when I'm in my flesh. How many of you know the difference between when your spirit's in control and when your flesh is in control? When that old nature, those old frustrations, um, I, I, think, I think when things aren't the way we want them, I think the primary thing that I hear in, my, in this generation now is frustration and criticism. That's why I pointed you towards social media is because the level of criticism the level of attack, the level of malice in the things that people post online is intense. It's cruel. There are things that come out of us that should never come out of somebody who says they love Jesus. But in our frustration, we often feel justified that this is so bad and that person is so useless and this situation is so wrong that it justifies me. But just, just before we say it justifies anything, let's keep in mind that the Sanhedrin justified their plot and success of killing Jesus and their plot to murder Paul, which drove this trial out of Jerusalem and into Caesarea, 
were the people who were supposed to be representing God in the world, and they thought that murder somehow was a good idea. Because we can warp our criticism and our, and our self-righteousness and our pride, and, and we can warp the situation to justify almost anything. And I would like to say from my own experience, I am most dangerous to the people I love and you. Sorry, I didn't mean to make that sound like those were two different groups. <laughs> to the people I love, including you, <laughs> is when I'm frustrated. That's when I'm most dangerous. That's when I'm most likely to be least like Jesus. I'm guilty of it. And I have felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit over, I'm going to say, over a few years now, where he's convicted me of my ranting. <laughs> have you ever gotten on a runaway? Who here, who here can rant? Once it gets going, it's hard to stop. <laughs> my ranting. To anyone who will listen... And what God says to me about this is that it's neither glorifying to Him, it's not helpful to the cause of Christ, it's not useful to the situation, nor is it endearing or attractive to even one person around me. It just doesn't help. I think we've made an art form out of criticism. It's the easiest thing to be drawn into, complaining. But it changes people's perspective for the worst. It destroys morale in families, in churches, in leadership teams, in businesses, in sports teams, in friend peer groups. How many of you would recognize that complaining and criticism of others is just, it has no redeeming quality? when it comes with a critical attitude. I'm not saying we can't identify that there are mistakes and wrongs. This is not what we're talking about. We're talking about developing this critical attitude where we throw out the baby and the bathwater. And it's not only my attitude, but it's everyone else's attitude too that's impacted. And I would say the most important reason that we shouldn't allow this to happen is that it's an absolute disobedience to God's command. In 1 Thessalonians 5, it says, Rejoice always. Okay, that's hard enough. Verse 17, Pray without ceasing. Oh, okay, strike two for Glenn. Um, verse 18, In everything give thanks. Well, okay, I'm out. One way, next batter, please. For this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Did you hear what he asked us to do? Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. Do not quench the spirit, which is, I think, what happens when we begin to be critical and complainy and whiny and frustrated and take it out on our loved ones. Probably not when we're journaling. That's probably okay. Do not quench the spirit. Do not despise prophetic utterances, but examine everything. Hold fast to that which is good. Abstain from every form of evil. This is what God says should be our approach to life. I think my biggest takeaway from the study of this chapter, though, is, is, a, is a thought on authority. If we look at the three specific parties involved in this drama, I am curious what authority they thought they had. What authority did they think that they were operating with? For the Sanhedrin, they believe they have God's sanction as the keepers of the Old Testament law that they are the defenders of the truth. But they also believe that they have control through their position, through their place in the Sanhedrin, through the aristocracy, which is the Jewish kind of ruling class, the, the wealthy and the rich. And it's interesting how power and wealth seem to accumulate in the same places. Their relationship with authority was that they believed maybe that it it came from their titles and position. And maybe even that they had it by divine right. They exercise it by using force of control. 
they were intimidators and they felt that this was just the Sanhedrin. Ooh, they're on the Sanhedrin. Ooh. Ooh, they're on the church board. Ooh, really think you are somebody, eh? Mm -hmm. I'm an elder now. No. No. If you want to be great in God's kingdom, if you want to be a, a leader in God's kingdom, what do you have to learn to be? The servant of all. And that's how we should view it. Ooh, I'm the high priest. Ooh, Pastor Allen's the senior pastor. The senior pastor. Or the lead pastor. When you get older, you ditch the senior thing because like, when you're young, you want to be the senior pastor, but now we want to be the lead pastor. We're the lead pastor. <laughs> and maybe all this came with a sense of privilege that they could bend and maybe break the rules if the cause was justified. That they could lie. They could plot. They could manipulate and yet they still believed that they represented God in his way. Jesus said, you'll give account for every idle word you speak, and we will answer for the means and the method and the motive with which we have operated in his name. I think we want to make sure that if we're going to name the name of Christ, that we not only have the attitude of Jesus, but that we do things for the right reasons, and you have to do things the right way. You just can't bend the rules. It's not worth it. Paul was a man who was able to stand with absolute confidence in that courtroom because he was a man who refused to compromise the truth. He refused to compromise the way. In 2 Corinthians, it says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but are divinely powerful for the destruction of strongholds. Your your Sanhedrin, your political clout, your wealth, your ability to manipulate and control or intimidate, all of those are weapons of the flesh. They're weapons of the natural world. And they don't produce spiritual fruit. Is it possible to be a carnal Christian? Answer out loud. To be a manipulative pastor? To be power-hungry controller? And a Christian? Yes? It's kind of quiet. Okay, this is longer than it needs to be because you're not saying nothing. <laughs> is it possible to be a Christian and be a manipulator? A controller? An intimidator? And at the same time, believe that we are walking in God's favor? These folks had natural power and influence but their carnality had stripped away any true authority and favor that came from God. They just couldn't see it in themselves. They didn't realize that they have drifted to this. And this is how the spirit of religion works. And this is how they actually find themselves in God's way persecuting God's servants. Let's talk about the authority that the Roman proconsul Felix believed he had. He has the knowledge of Christian truth. He was scared by it. He had seen it. But he didn't submit it himself to God. He didn't submit to it. His sense of his authority is the power of Rome. Social power, political power. He has the military backing him. He has influence to control or even end human life. I wonder if it went to his head. But how much authority does he really have? It reminds me of another trial. Maybe you remember it. There was another judge who thought he had authority too. In John 19, it says, The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by that law, he ought to die because he made himself out to be the Son of God. Who's on trial here? Jesus. Therefore, when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. And he entered into the praetorium again and he said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Verse 10, so Pilate said to him, do you do not speak to me? Do you not know I have the authority to release you and I have the authority to crucify you? What authority does he think he has? What authority did Felix think he had? Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me unless it had been granted you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me to you has the greater sin. 
And as a result of this, Pilate made efforts to release him. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you release this man, you are no friend of Caesar. And everyone who makes himself out to be a king opposes Caesar. And so what does Pilate eventually do? He gives in against his own conscience, and he allows Jesus to be crucified. Like Pilate, Felix thinks his government position, his standing in society, give him control. But how much control did he really have over Paul? And I would propose to you that he has none. We know that Paul is going to Rome. Felix isn't going to be able to stop that. Ultimately, what control, what authority did he really have? None. Note the confidence of Paul. He knows he's in the will of God. And throughout this whole process, despite being sidelined by things that are out of control, Paul can say with a clear conscience, he has obeyed his Lord. He has been faithful to his call ever since that day on the road to Damascus when he was called of God and he repented. He has followed the leading of the Spirit. He has been willing and diligent. He has nothing to hide. He's willing to stand in that trial and declare who he is and what he's all about and welcomes all accusations against him. He says, my conscience is clear. You know, there's tremendous confidence that comes when we can say that I have been faithful and I have been honest and I have been truthful. It's very hard to argue with somebody who's in that position. It's very difficult to defend yourself when you know that you haven't been. Can we say that to Jesus? Can we say that to our spouse? Can we say that to our kids? I have acted with integrity to the best of my ability as the Lord has led me. I've been faithful to my calling as a dad, as a husband, as a father, as a church member, as a church leader, as a member of this, this community. I have done everything that I can in the name and for the glory of God. Can you say that? Who here wants to be able to say that? Who wants to be able to just take your stand? Having done everything to stand, the scripture says, stand. Stand. Take your stand. Let the chips fall where they may. Do you have confidence? There's only one way to have it, and that's simply to be faithful and be obedient to the Lordship of Christ in your life. But that means you need to know Him. That means you need to have a walk with Him and a relationship with Him. Can I ask you, when's the last time you had a significant interaction where you really felt the presence of Jesus? I hope it was sometime today. I hope you're having one now. <laughs> That's what's supposed to be happening. I hope you have it when you're listening to your worship music or you're listening to podcasts. I hope you have it in your home. I hope you have it when you kneel down to pray for your family, your kids, your coworkers, whatever. I hope that you feel like you're connecting to Jesus because that's what changes everything, knowing that you're being faithful to the call of God. Do you know what you don't get? you don't get to have control. Because in all of this, and with all of his confidence, with all of his truth, one thing Paul didn't have was control. He didn't have control over his own life. And may I pose to you today that one of the worst times for us as Christians is when we feel like we're out of control and we're feeling like God is not answering our prayers and maybe God's not even doing the right thing by us. And then where do we go and where does our heart go? And what kind of Christians are we then? Are we loyal to Jesus? Are we loyal, loyal to the call of God? When I look at Paul in this journey towards Rome, I, I was thinking about this and God actually gave me a picture. So I want to share it with you and I would like you to consider whether you would ask God to make this true of you too. I thought of Paul in all the things that were coming down the stream of time, the river of time towards him. All of the things that were going on. And I saw a huge boulder in the middle of a river. <laughs> huge, huge rock towering up out of the river. And as the stream in the river was rushing by, no matter whether it was a flood, whether there was trees and banks, whether the river was raging and, and torrents and, and had debris in it, everything went around the rock <laughs> in the picture. Everything, life flowed around the rock. But Paul was stationed right here in the center of the will of God. And there was nothing that was going to move him 
from that place. It's not stubbornness. It's not willpower. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. It's actually submission to God that allows you to feel that. Paul is firmly planted. He's rooted in Christ in jail for the purpose of God. Where are you? Where are you planted? What's the river of life that's rushing by you right now? Are you firmly planted in this river of life and time? Are you firmly anchored in the presence of Jesus? Because that's what makes it make all that's what makes all the difference. Take courage. It takes faith to put your life in the hands of God. But it's where true freedom and where real authority is. When we're walking in obedience to Christ, that's where we have real authority. Because authority is only as good as the one who gives it. And Jesus says in Luke 10, Behold, I have given you authority to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all of the power of the enemy. Are you anchored in Jesus today? Romans 8, Paul would write these words, and I think they were true of him in this moment in his life as he sits in house arrest. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Are you anchored there? Are you anchored in Jesus? The words of the old hymn, I've anchored in Jesus the storms of life I'll brave. I'm anchored in Jesus for he has power to save. I'm anchored to the rock of ages. Let's bow and pray. Heavenly Father, I want to thank you this morning for the example and the steadfastness of Paul as he faced situations that were not what he wanted and that he didn't have control over. But Lord, just thank you for his example. And Jesus, thank you that you were faithful to be with him, that you walked him through every step of his journey. And thank you that you're willing to do the same with us. And I wonder, as we're bowed in prayer here this morning, as you're maybe watching online, is there, if you're here this morning, if you're hearing this word, maybe you feel like you're being tossed about by the storms of life. And this morning, you understand that the only safety and security you will have, the only help that's out there for you is in Jesus Christ. If you're willing to surrender your way and repent of your sins and your mistakes in life and trust your life to Jesus and invite him in, he will make you a new creation and he will go to work on your behalf to cause all things to work together for your good. And so if that's you this morning, with respect for what's happening, we're with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if that's you, would you just raise your hand? And I'd just like to lead you in a simple prayer that will open the door to a relationship with Jesus. God bless you. Is there anyone else looking up in the balcony? You're ready. You, you want this life in Christ. You want to learn what that means to walk with him. Well, somebody has raised their hand this morning, so I'd like to invite all of you just to pray. Many of you have prayed this prayer already, but maybe you could pray it out loud together. Uh, uh, with those who have raised their hands or those who are maybe following online. Pray, Lord Jesus, I thank you that you love me. I thank you that you see the brokenness of this world. But you aren't afraid of it. You don't hold yourself away from us. But you came and you died on the cross and you shed your blood so that we could be forgiven of our sin, so that we could have a new life with you at control. And so this morning, I confess my sin. I confess ruling my own life. And I want to surrender today to the Lordship of Jesus. So Jesus, I invite you in. Make me a new creation. I surrender myself to you. Thank you for the gift of eternal life. 
Thank you for the help of the Holy Spirit who's going to teach me how to walk with you. And thank you for churches and families and pastors who are going to help me in my journey. In Jesus' name, amen.